with uh, some sneaky contenders. Had Colton Fetter asked me, who are some teams basically that you're keeping an eye on that maybe aren't the teams that are going to win the conference or are going to, you know, have that that auto bid, but some teams that might, you know, find their way in the back door, be one of those at large bids. We go to 12 teams next year. Who has a chance to really make some noise? This is a team we've been high on for a while here. We've said this many times. We think Ole Miss is going to be a wagon next year, and it's twofold. One, Lane Kiffin is you know, more or less having a pretty large hand in what goes on there offensively. So as long as that's the case, I'm going to go ahead and pencil them in for right around 30 plus points a game in 2024. Okay, I don't think that's a, that's a stretch. Also look at Jackson Dart. I thought he really got cooking in the second year of that scheme. The RPO thing fit him like a glove after he got some more time in that system. He took a huge jump from year one to year two. You have a bunch of weapons from Trey Harris to Juice Wells. I understand Quinshawn Judkins not toting the rock for you there anymore. He's gone to Columbus. I still feel really good about that offense. So in that sense, they can win shootouts. Now, the big part of this, and y'all that have watched this show for any length of time, you, you know how we feel about this. Um, they're going to be really good in the trenches. Going to be really good in the trenches. Uh, Walter Nolan, uh, Tyler Barron, Prince Lee, Uman Mielin. That side of the football for them, I thought was a governor. Given the last couple of seasons, especially this past season, that they weren't bad, but they weren't great, allowed four yards of carry on the ground. That's no longer the governor. They're, they're no longer going to show up and get pushed around by an Alabama or a Georgia. Now, hear me clearly. I'm not saying they have surpassed them or gotten on their level, but I think from a talent and personnel perspective in the trenches, they are in that same vicinity. They can at least give something back to you if you're one of those programs going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And that's what it takes to win in the SEC. So if you're Ole Miss, the other part of this, the reason why I think they could be a problem, who wanted to play Ole Miss at the end of the year this year? I don't think anybody wanted to see them in a 12-team playoff format by how hot they were this past season. And also, with this new playoff format, what had kept them from getting into the playoff was, okay, well, we got to get past Bama, we got to get past LSU, we got to get past Georgia to win the SEC and to be in that four-team playoff. You can now drop, I would say, two of those games and still find your way in the dance. Now, the path is a little bit more difficult, but by nature of what this prompt is, sneaky contenders, I think Ole Miss is absolutely a team to watch. So let me, let me know what y'all think about that. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to this channel right here. We talk college football again every single day, live three times a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern. Want y'all dialed in here. So we appreciate y'all being locked in. Now, another team we got to talk about here as the tectonic plates shift across the college football landscape. Uh, they were previously in the Pac-12. Rest in peace. Miss you, Pac-12. They're going to be in the Big 12, and that is the Utah Utes. And for Utah... They got Cam Rising coming back for his 27th year playing college football. God bless him. He's got some sweet flow. He's going to be a doctor by the time he finishes school, and we love him for that. Go ahead, man. Rumble, young man, rumble. Like, for me, and this is a, this is a sidebar, uh, if you can play college football for 20 years, play college football for 20 years. You got the rest of your life to work. You got the rest of your life to do something professionally. If you can play ball and, and go to school for free while doing it, y'all do that. Okay, so that's my soapbox. I'll get off that now. Going back to Utah, they got an experienced quarterback in Cam Rising. And you can't help but feel, man, Kyle Whittingham coached football teams at Utah have looked the same way for the last 10 years. Great up front, tough in the, in the trenches, and they're, they're very physical. Uh, they don't flinch in, in the, you know, the fourth quarter. The culture is so strong, and the identity of that team is so strong from year to year. The personnel, to me, almost becomes 1B. I didn't say secondary, but it does become 1B. And with the quarterback running the show, and with no Oklahoma or Texas in the Big 12, I don't see a reason why Utah can't compete, not just for the Big 12, which I suppose would kind of make them a not-so-sneaky contender, but I think they're going to be a team that's definitely in the mix when you come to this you know, 12-team playoff format. I don't think the experience of Cam Rising should be overlooked. I truly don't. I mean, we saw that in the national title game this year. Two teams that had played a lot of football. Veteran roster in Washington, veteran quarterback in Michael Penix Jr., same deal with Michigan. J.J. McCarthy played in a lot of big stages. Michigan, a, a very adult team across the board in terms of the upperclassmen that had played for them. So when it comes to Utah, I love the way they're built. I love their identity, and I love their maturity. They're a team to watch when it comes to this 12-team format. Now, here's one that's going to kind of get the party going a little bit here. How about Tennessee? Just sit with that for a second. Let it, let it kind of marinate. Tennessee, I think, 
was such a hot team coming into this season. Why? Because of Hendon Hooker, because of what that offense did, because of how they were just scheming it up so effectively and the way that Josh Heupel had elevated that thing. They had just beat Alabama the year before. You had people in Knoxville saying, okay, hey, Joe Milton, his tools now. Maybe we just kind of pick it where we left off. If the secondary gets a little bit better, we find ourselves in Atlanta. And it didn't go how you would have hoped it would go. It didn't go perfectly this year. I think there was probably... Some missed expectations on Joe Milton. I didn't say underperformances. I said some mixed expectations now on Joe Milton. But the thing for me is we've seen what that offense is supposed to do when you have a capable quarterback. I did not say Joe Milton is incapable, but I do think there were some things that limited you for what you wanted to do offensively. Enter into the fray. A man whose jersey I expect to be extremely high selling here in Knoxville. And that is number eight, Nico Iamaliava, the number one player in the class of 2023 for us here at On3. I'm just saying, I don't think we know what he is yet. And I was the first one saying, hey, be slow to give him the Heisman Trophy from what he did in the bowl game. I think that's still true. I think that's still fair. But I go back to this thought, how good can he be? How good can he be? Take it a step further. How good can this offense be with a guy who has all the tools and all the ability physically at quarterback to make the intermediate throws, to make the deep throws. Because Joe Milton had the tools. I don't know that he was consistent. Nico, I think, could be the same way. He has all the tools, and his consistency factor, maybe it's higher. That's all I'm saying. So we've seen what the hypo offense is supposed to do. We've seen them compete at the highest level with the right guy playing quarterback. I think Tennessee could be a wagon when it comes to this 12-team playoff. And again, just what we said, you don't have to win all the games to get in the dance now. A 10-2 SEC team will be in. Mark my words. The schedule's tough for Tennessee, just to be clear, but I, I think they have a very real chance to make some noise if Nico is as advertised and is able to kind of come along pretty quickly. Heck, keep an eye on, keep an eye on, on uh, Tennessee if they go 9-3 and because I think the roster will be, uh, or not the roster, rather, the schedule will be so difficult to where you may see a team sneak in there with a 9-3 and three record in the SEC and Big, and Big Ten, respectively. Uh, this was a team I wasn't even sure I wanted to put on here. And I'm not sure I even want to go too deeply in, in terms of talking about them. But I look at the ACC. <clears throat> it just feels so wide open to me. Because Clemson isn't Clemson anymore. Florida State, they have to reload a lot of different pieces. Who knows what Miami is? So I'm going to talk about two of those three teams I just mentioned, man. Like, what about Clemson? Like, because Clemson is an ultimate back-against-the-wall mode. It feels like they've been back-against-the-wall for a little bit here. But, like, there's no more excuses if you're Clemson in terms of what you haven't done with Dabo Sweeney the last couple of seasons. Right? First, it was DJU's fault. Turns out this past year, maybe it wasn't DJU's fault as much as some people thought. And then it's, well, okay, give K. Klubnik some time. Okay, well, we got to get our, 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 you know, our skill players right. Like, I'm at the point now where, given the under achieving of the last couple of years I think there's a real sense of urgency and there's, and there's a real hunger in Clemson South Carolina and the roster is still solid I'm just curious how they're constructed if that'll be good enough to win the ACC ultimately which I think would make them a sneaky contender in that sense now here's the major major caveat I want to put on this as it pertains to the next team we're talking about here with how open the ACC is and how young of talent Miami has I think they have a chance to make some noise now, I'm probably in the minority in that department, but that's fine. If they land to Leah Tagovailoa, which you would fully expect them to be in the market for him if he does get a waiver and, and is able to have another year and, and, you know, they go and get him via the transfer portal, that would, I think, change the entire complexion of how we view Miami. Because I still think that the Shannon Dawson offense has some juice. I still think we saw glimpses of it a season ago with Tyler Van Dyke when he was on his P's and Q's. Now, that didn't last the duration of the season. The bottom line here is, I don't think we've seen their full form yet. It sounds like they missed on Cam Ward. I mean, well, we know they missed on Cam Ward, brought him in for a visit. If you land a quarterback of Tia, uh, Talia Tagovailoa's caliber and get the, the, the Tagovailoa brothers, both in Miami, man. You got Brother Tua up the street playing for the Dolphins. You got Talia and Coral Gables. Like, I just think that would be a match made in heaven. And I think Miami would be a force in the ACC and uh, could be a force when it comes to that that 12-team playoff. In terms of force, I mean, they would be sneaky. I think they'd find their way in the dance. So keep an eye on those teams. I think those are all teams to watch, but a great question from our guy Colton. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also, be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.